Now that I have the power supply part of the amp build done, I can get the proper amp boards put together. And I took the time to film doing the first one. And if you've ever done this before, it's going to look very familiar. You start with the smallest components first, and then work your way up to the biggest ones. But the idea is that you don't want to be putting stuff in there that's going to get it in the way of what you need to put in next. So I started with the resistors and got all those put in, at least the small ones anyway. And then I moved on to the bigger components. Now this is my first time putting together a double sided board like this with through plated holes. And I gotta say it's a game changer for me. You know I like making my own boards but you really can't beat this. Now the solder that I'm using here is the standard rosin core 6040. Nothing special about it. In fact the roll that I have here I've had since the 90s. I just recently found it and thought it would use it here. And the way I'm doing this is probably not a whole lot different from anybody else. I put in so many components, solder them in place, and then snip off the leads. So it doesn't get too crowded on the bottom, you know, with leads sticking out all over the place. And then you miss one while you're soldering it, and then you have to try to track down that problem after you power on the board. Now I should say something about the components that I'm using here. These are all really high quality parts. Now I'm not going to claim that that makes a huge difference, but I guess you can say that psychologically it kind of has a placebo effect. You know, if it looks better and the parts cost a little bit more and have a good reputation for performance, and then overall you're going to have a good feeling about the amp and that's really half the battle where this is concerned. Because it's my opinion that all competently designed amps are going to sound very similar to each other in fact, it's going to be virtually impossible to tell them apart. That's my opinion, though, based on my experience. As you can see, I'm putting in the bigger components. These are capacitors and also the trim pot to adjust the idle current. Now what I'm doing here is I'm bundling together two transistors so that they're face to face and I've got a small piece of heat shrink put on them to hold them tight together and that's so that they'll operate at the same temperature. There are two pairs of transistors that I'm going to do that with. It's the input pair and also the current mirror for the differential input. And once again, the transistors that I'm using here are really good quality. These are ones that I bought about 15 years ago, back when they were still being made. Now, if I have one complaint about the board, it's the pad size is a little bit small, especially on the very small components like these transistors. If I had it to do over again, I would have made them a little bit bigger. The two larger transistors that I'm soldering in here are the voltage amplification stage and also the current source for the voltage amplification stage. Now what I'm doing here is I got a solder bridge that I've got to get rid of. That's one of the problems with those pads being so small and so close together. It's easy to bridge them. I'm using some separate flux to try to liquefy it a little bit more. Also got the screwdriver in there to scrape it away and then I'll check it with the multimeter make sure it's still not shorted. What I've got here is the output inductor wrapped around the resistor that goes with it. I chose to do it this way instead of separate, mainly to save space. And also I've done this in the past and I've really never noticed a difference. I don't think it actually does make a difference. The only thing is that it can be a little bit tricky getting this put together, but it does, like I said, take up less space. And the inductor is something you make yourself. You just take some magnet wire, which is coated with varnish, and you wrap it around a pencil or something until you get 10 or 12 turns. And that's enough for what you're looking for here. This is a filter that helps prevent oscillation. And oscillation and thermal performance are the two major problems that can happen with an amp. And I did all the testing on that with the prototype board that I made in the beginning. Now I can get the drivers and the output transistors mounted. And I set up a piece of plywood as a template so I can get these all in the right place. And that way all the boards will be exactly the same with the transistors in the same place. Now that I have it done, I can use that board as a template to mark out the mounting holes on the heatsink. 
I have five of these amp boards in a row and they need to be equally spaced out on the heatsink. Also down low enough so I have space up above to mount the crossover boards after I get to that part of the build. And instead of tapping these out, I'm just going to use a coarse thread metal screw. I've used these in the past without any issues whatsoever. Had amps running for years and years and years. Never had any loosen up. So this isn't me taking the easy way. It's me avoiding buying a number four tap. The screws have to be that small to go through the hole in the transistor. So with that done and it mounted on the heatsink temporarily, I can power it up with the full supply. And powering it up, you'll see the green LED light up. You'll also see the scope flicker a little bit because that's connected to the output. The output is also connected to an 8 ohm dummy load. Now what I'm doing right now is I'm adjusting the idle current. Before I powered up this board, I turned it all the way down. And that's really what you want to do to make sure that it's not drawing some outrageous amount of power when you start it up, especially on the full supply like I'm doing here. And then I can put some signal in and yes, it's working. But then again, I knew that before I did this because I actually tested it on my lab supply, which is current limited, so I won't blow it up in case I did something wrong. So the next thing that I did was I spent maybe four or five hours playing around with my laptop with different sound cards, trying to get the settings right to do what you're looking at on the screen right now. And this is a distortion measurement that I did with REW. The red line up across the top is the frequency response from 20 hertz on the left to 20 kilohertz on the right. And you can see that it's nice and flat. And then the stuff that you see across the bottom is the noise floor. First of all, that's the one that's showing the most. The other squiggly stuff that you see beneath that are the harmonics. And you can see all that in the scale on the bottom. The second harmonic is point. 0.026%. Very low distortion in this amplifier. Absolutely nothing that you will ever hear. This is limited by the equipment that I'm using, including the audio interface that I used. But what this shows is that the amp is at least this good. That first measurement was at around one watt output into eight ohms. This next one is at higher power. It's actually 12 watts into that eight ohm load. And you can see that the noise floor is still really low. Also, the distortion hasn't gone up that much either. This next plot is the more traditional way of showing amplifier distortion. You got the one kilohertz fundamental. That's the big spike. Next to that is the second harmonic at 2K, third harmonic at 3K, fourth harmonic at 4K, and so on and so forth all going down in magnitude. But I should mention that this measurement also includes the sound card in it. Whereas the other two plots before this included a calibration of the sound card to take the distortion that the sound card itself has away and it gives a more pure representation of what the actual numbers of the amp are. So you can see up in the left-hand top corner, you got the same distortion readings, but they're higher because, like I said, they include the sound card. But once again, this is all so low in magnitude that you'll never hear it. I also figured out how to run IMD measurements. And what that measurement does is it injects two tones at the same time. In this case, it's a 41 hertz signal and a 8K signal. Once again, this is going into the 8 ohm dummy load. And also, once again, this plot includes the distortion that the sound card has so that the amp is going to be lower. But once again, this is all very low and well below anything you'll be able to hear. And this is another IMD plot. This one uses two tones at a lower frequency, 41 hertz and 89 hertz. And once again, very, very low distortion. I got exceptional performance from this amplifier overall. 